Welcome to a McKenzie Institute Long Talk. These are 20 of the best ideas that I can think of in urban amenities and services. Great design equals great safety. Let's start with greening cities, a buzzword all over the world. And it's been a buzzword for hundreds of years. Think of how old Central Park, Stanley Park, Wascana Park, Mount Royal Park. We have parks all over the world that are hundreds of years old. We also have greening projects that uh, means everything from window boxes to rooftop gardens to regular tree plantings. Now these are great ideas because plantings are the solution to heat days and heat days are coming more plentifully and they attack vulnerable people such as the elderly, people who have to work outdoors in manual labor and people with respiratory problems. So we need green cities. The World Health Organization has guidelines. You can look up where your city fits in and you can do your own bit uh, with everything from a window box to something on the balcony, terrace, or the roof. These solutions are also solutions to flooding. Many of the emergencies declared in North America are as a result of flooding and flooding comes from either excess rain, it comes from huge snowfalls which then melt and block up streams. So if we can plant more trees, we've solved two problems, the heat and the flooding problem. We need water management, we need water conservation, especially if global warming is happening, and we need plantings that can exist with uh, less amounts of water. Trees are the lungs of the city, but they also create microclimates. When you go for a walk in a park underneath the trees, you are breathing fresher air, you're in a slightly cooler temperature, you're in a little more humid environment, and it really is better for your health. We need species that are going to thrive in the future climate that we can predict for our cities, and we need everybody to get on board. Next idea, the use of our waterways. Waterways were our transport system for hundreds and hundreds of years all over the world. In Russia, they tried to get to China via the inland waterways, and in Europe, they tried to get to China by crossing the ocean. So everybody's trying to get somewhere, and the water was the waterway. In North America, most of our cities are on waterways because that was our transport system uh, via canoe and later bigger boats. Uh, because our forests were impassable. I think we need to go back to the waterway to live, to work, and to play. Now, think of commuter ferries in New York and in uh, Vancouver where they have a sea bus. I think we could use a lot more of our waterways for transport. They are also our open space. We talk about that a lot. We say we need to set aside open space. If you live on a lake or a large river, you have open space right in front of you. We need pedestrian causeways. Uh, waterways can be a venue for events, parades, festivals. As in Jones Beach, there can be a band shell there. And there can be floating amenities, parks, housing, sport, and recreation. Now let's say a word about sport. A uh, North American professional sports uh, stadium costs uh, maybe anywhere between three, four hundred million and a couple of billion dollars to build. Uh, with BC Place, it was cheaper to renovate it than it was to knock it down and start again because the cost of disposal is a high cost as well. Might uh, surprise some people to know that it, there are only eight home games in the United States National Football League, yet a billion dollar or even a two billion dollar stadium may exist. What if we had a floating stadium? and cities such as Toronto, Buffalo, Rochester, Hamilton shared it. What about in the Bay Area? What about in the New York, New Jersey area? Uh, what about in the Washington area and in the Los Angeles area? This could be a real plus. And in Tokyo, they've landed a plane on a floating runway in Tokyo Bay, so our waterways can be uh, tremendous for uh, living, working, playing, generating power as well. Building materials. You've heard of the LEED building program. There's the BREAM building program. There's also now Net Zero. LEED and BREAM are ways of qualifying as an environmentally friendly building, and they have their strengths and weaknesses. Net Zero means you don't need to have uh, any plugging in of the grid or any electricity in your building for heating and cooling because you uh, generate that right on site. Great idea. There's also the World Green Building Council, and you can look up where your city fits into that and which one of these your uh, city uses. 
But on the horizon is woven building material. We're going back to the 60s with woven technology, woven circuits as opposed to the integrated hard circuit. And you can actually weave a building right on site with a gigantic loom and it will have all the services in there. It will generate electricity, it'll have solar power, it may have wind power, it'll have all your uh, uh, plugs and uh, all your wiring in it. And you build that right on site and it is going to be light, uh, yet it's going to be stronger than steel and you can put another couple of floors on a building without uh, damaging that building at all. For other materials, we need sticky surfaces for people with mobility challenges and we need automated awnings and baffles. It really astounds me, um, having been in Vancouver where people uh, stood under the uh, awning of the Bay department store to get out of the rain. Uh, it's astounding to me that we don't have more use of awnings and baffles in the climate that we have, but I think that that should be coming. Biofeedback. Again, with the woven circuit, we are going to be able to wear clothing that gives instant feedback to our physician at our hospital and to emergency services on how we're doing. If we're suffering from the heat on a heat day or we have a chronic illness or respiratory problem, a cardiovascular problem, all of a sudden a self-driving vehicle can pick us up and take us to the medical professional that we need to see. Uh, my shirt will tell uh, everybody who needs to know that I'm not feeling well. It's also going to be a communication vehicle just like on the TV program Star Trek. We're going to shift work to suit the climate. Now I got this idea from the mayor of Boston. The mayor commissioned a study on climate change which is hundreds of pages long. It's an excellent read. It doesn't mince words. It articulates the problem but it articulates some solutions and they put some solutions in place including a park on the waterways that drains better and is less susceptible to erosion or less susceptible when uh, water levels rise. Mist sprays for people at concerts to cool them down. Uh, workers who have to do hard manual labor out uh, on hot asphalt, they're going to try to change those shifts maybe 7 to 3 instead of 9 to 5 so that in the hottest part of the day, mid-afternoon, uh, you're on your commute home. Uh, trees for the future climate that they're going to have. They've noted that street crime goes down in extreme heat days. Understandably, people are indoors, but domestic crime goes up, so there's going to have to be a policing response to this. And any air-conditioned rooms are a net benefit. Maybe every party room in condos and uh, co-ops and apartment buildings should be air-conditioned. Maybe there should be a public policy that gets seniors into air-conditioned movie theaters. Whatever it is, we need a solution to the heat. Car sharing. Well, I got this idea from a wonderful article called The High Cost of Free Parking. And that catches the eye, doesn't it? Free parking uh, sounds free. Except the article suggests that people are driving around looking for low cost or free street parking when what they could do is go right into a higher cost elevated parking garage and be done with it. Uh, the supposition is that this generates a lot of traffic, a lot of pollution, and a lot of waste of time in our cities. If we were sharing cars through either self-driving or maybe in condos and co-ops, um, the building owns a dozen cars all the same and residents can take out the one that's available. At any rate, with some kind of car sharing and uh, cars on the road, self-driving cars on the road 24 hours a day except for repairs, we may cut way, way down on all that traffic. Not a bad idea. This article I read, high cost of free parking, says 3.5 to 14 minutes per occasion to find a parking spot. Again, waste of time. 8 to 74% of traffic is drivers looking for parking. And in condominiums and apartments and with car sharing, we can address that problem. Police discretion. Well, you've heard of the broken windows theory of policing in North America, where if you fix the litter on the street or the vandalism, the broken window, the graffiti, you're on your way to solving bigger crime problems. And the reason this theory has taken hold is that this was done during the Giuliani uh, mayoralty time in New York and crime went down. Problem is, crime went down in Washington as well. Crime went down elsewhere. Uh, there's a correlation, but there may no, not be a causal relationship. 
So let's take a look at that from another point of view. A friend of mine, retired inspector Anil Anand, has written a book called Mending Broken Windows Policing. And he says, not using discretion, where in the olden days a cop might say, move along, buddy, or what are you doing here, or uh, can I give you a hand, when you are policing every tiny infraction, you lose the trust of the community, you are seen as someone who is in opposition to most people, and when you need that community uh, for uh, witnesses or for cooperation on bigger crimes, you may not have it. So what I say is cameras uh, can be our broken windows policing. Anytime somebody goes through a stop sign, anytime somebody turns uh, left where they shouldn't, then what you do is you send them a ticket in the mail with a picture of what they're doing. They can be responsible for their own vehicle, even if they lend it out, and be done with that aspect of policing. And more mental health workers. Something like 60% of police calls in our major cities in North America really involve a mental health issue or a homeless person issue. What we need is trained professionals who are probably lower paid than a police officer at $100,000 a year with tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment in the car and on the belt. There is a better solution to that. Now, delivering the goods. Um, in dense urban areas, we have a lot of things that need to be delivered. Everything from building materials to prescription drugs to food to purchases, and we need a better way of doing it than, than clogging up the streets with gigantic trucks. What I say is, number one, the home delivery of gasoline. There are experiments. There are colleagues of mine in the oil industry who've been talking about this for 30 years. We have our heating fuel delivered to our homes. Why not gasoline? Then cars aren't lined up at gas stations, driving around looking for the best price. It's delivered right to your home. Your car is always filled up and you're always ready to evacuate in an emergency. Public transit can be part of the delivery mechanism. If we had postal stations at the end of every subway and bus route in our major cities, or light rail or heavy rail, we could then load some of those uh, goods onto the transit vehicle and sort the mail right on that vehicle, sort the packages, just like was done 150 years ago on trains in North America, the mail car, if you will, and the postal worker, the courier, other people get out at the closest stop and use a bicycle or a smaller vehicle to get those goods to people's homes. Uh, depots at the end of the transit lines is what I'm advocating. Barges on our waterways could turn our waterways into a delivery mechanism as well. And those same mechanisms could be used to take garbage out of town as well. Going up. Going up in cities has been a great idea for hundreds and hundreds of years when there was a well in medieval times. If you were 10 paces away from it, you had to walk to it to get the water. And it was usually a woman who did that work. If you're 10 floors above it, you take the elevator down and you have the services you need. So density is a great idea. The second and third floors of all of our urban spaces can be invigorated with elevated transit and access to them because those floors are not usually as valuable real estate as the main floor. Um, elevated transit can be underwritten in part by the companies that own the buildings, hotels perhaps, condos perhaps, that have that transit go into the third floor and invigorate that real estate. And we can also have elevated urban parks on our rooftops, as in Highline Park, there's one in Paris. Um, elevated parks are a great way to walk through a dense urban area and see the sights. Going out, uh, our planning used to like satellite cities. Well, all they are is a way for people to have to commute back and forth, uh, it turns out. But going out means satellite offices for government and for services and for industry, where people don't have to go back and forth, they just go out and they do that work there. High-speed rail to connect them and using our waterways for living, playing, and connecting our urban centers and those who work on behalf of our urban centers outside of the urban uh, boundaries. Popping up. These pop-up amenities can change with the demographics. If a certain type of food comes into fashion, you pop up a little container with that kind of food in it, and if it works, maybe you make it more permanent. Uh, same thing with retail. Ralph Lauren made his uh, fortune in part by starting out with great big tractor trailers of his uh, clothing, 
and took them to remote university and college campuses so the students could buy. You can do the same thing with a container. They are available for $4,000, brand new, and I'm sure uh, many companies would donate a used one that's no longer serviceable to allow for pop-up amenities uh, in a, a city. Take a look at Portland for restaurants and take a look at Toronto for pop-ups as well. They can serve educational needs. There can be a health station in a pop-up uh, facility. Uh, there can be all kinds of things. Doesn't work? Tow it away. Isn't needed? Tow it to a new location. If the dynamics and demographics of the city change, take it to where it's needed. Get on the grid. Now, getting on the grid uh, sounds dangerous because a solar event or terrorism can disable uh, the grid for 131 million Americans and who knows how long it would take to get back on. But in the future, what we're going to be able to do is all sell into the grid using our own solar, our wind, our biothermal, our net zero building, and sell into the grid so that we never experience a brownout or a blackout. The grid is multifaceted with a lot of subgrids in it and much more resilient, and possibly no heating charges for some of us who are on the grid. So carving up the grid is a good idea, but everybody getting on the grid is a good idea too. Sounds contradictory, but it can work. Ban small engines. I have heard the statistic, 20% of all urban air pollution is generated by small engines. The leaf blowers, the lawn mowers, the uh, hedge clippers, all this stuff should either be electric or battery. And yes, I know that relocates the problem, but if you're relocating the problem to a plant that doesn't uh, pollute or that has a huge economy of scale, you're creating a less of a problem as you relocate it. But these are noisy, they are smelly, they pollute the air, they should not exist. So what's the solution? Uh, plain old brooms, rakes, shovels, buckets, the old fashioned way of cleaning up the lawn. Also, we can plant slow growing ivy, slow growing grass, honeycombs made of concrete with slow growing green vegetation inside them, zero scaping, and tall grass is a very nice landscaping uh, feature that doesn't need high maintenance. Co-location. The co-location of amenities in urban areas is an idea whose time has long come. Uh, here's the manifestation that I've been involved in and that is a community campus. In a small community north of Toronto, the Community library was too big. Uh, there weren't enough residents using it. And a couple of blocks away, the library in the high school was too small. Too many students needing access to those books. Well, what's the obvious solution? You combine the two on or off campus and turn the entire small town into a walkable urban campus where the students go to the library to get their books, or the residents come into the school to get their books. There are security issues with co-location. So if members of the general community are using the pool or the gym or the meeting rooms, the classrooms, uh, after four o'clock and on the weekends, you, you know, you do have a security issue, but it has been solved in many, many locations. And it's a great use of the facility. You also don't lose the high school. The one that I was involved in was in danger of being shut down because it wasn't big enough. You shut down a high school and bus students away, you lose after school programs, they don't have uh, after school jobs, and you take 500 students out of the community who aren't buying coffee or going to uh, the coffee shop, and that's a real devastation for the community. You can also have an emergency operations center on the school facilities, an EMS station, a police station, and some of these facilities would in turn be internship possibilities for the students and let them learn about what it's like to be in that kind of an occupation. Preserve is the next great idea. You know, these preserved buildings on the waterfront, the historic properties, the waterfront in Baltimore and Halifax and Vancouver, these are big attractions and they're also big business for cities. But there's a great book out called Tabula Plena, how to build in a dense urban area where Development is, by definition, redevelopment. You can't put these buildings under plexiglass uh, as if they were in a museum. You do have to use them, and that makes them much more vibrant and tell a great story better than one that is uh, more of a museum piece. Next big idea, make a place for you and me. 
I got this idea a while back walking down the street in my hometown of Toronto where there was a fair amount of snow on the road. Um, there was a bike lane. Uh, there was street parking. And because the street was taken up by a bike lane and parked cars, there was very little room for a car to pass. And then on the sidewalk, there's not only the snow, which there is many months out of the year in Toronto and in many other cities, but there were garbage cans and recycling bins and telephone poles and uh, mailboxes and, uh, and, and boxes for newspapers. I mean, it was a mess. There was no place for me, the pedestrian. It's great that we put bike sharing on our sidewalks. It's great that we have places to chain up a bike, but we have to leave room for people to have conversations, a cup of coffee, park benches, people with mobility challenges need to, be, need to sit there. So all this stuff is great, but we need a place for you and me in our cities. Double your pleasure. In my view, anything in a city that is a dual purpose amenity is better value. Maybe one doesn't work as well as you'd hoped. Maybe the other one will. So for example, a park bench can also be a place where parks staff can store toys and games for kids who are in a parks program in the summer. Uh, the bench can also be a place to store emergency equipment, uh, barbecues, uh, life-saving first aid kits. All kinds of things can be stored in our parks. Streets are great for transport. You get from one place to the other on a street. But if that street is also a nice place to sit and look and chat and have a cup of coffee, it's a better street. So, double your pleasure, dual purpose amenities. Save water. You know, in many old North American cities, and I bet this is even more true in Europe, vitreous clay pipes transport water around, underneath the ground. Uh, I've heard anywhere between 10 and 30% of that fresh potable water is wasted. It's crazy. PVC pipe lasts 100 years. We should be replacing that pipe not only as a cost-effective measure, as a safety measure, and as a public health measure. Uh, it is kind of crazy to turn potable water that is a necessity of life into something we wash our cars with and flush our toilets with. That's the other thing we should do is have what are called white water or brown water systems to spray the underside of cars as they go in and out of underground garages, uh, preserves the car, preserves the underground garage because the salt from the road doesn't get into the rebar and expand it and pop it out, creating hundreds of millions of dollars in damage in our cities. Golf courses can operate with less water. Uh, the fire department can use less water testing their fire uh, hydrants, and we can use types of vegetation that use less water. So whatever you do, save water because it's, um, it's not exactly a non-renewable resource, but there's no more of it being made in this closed system here on the earth. Walk. Turns out urbanites are fitter than rural folks, and I've lived on a farm, I've done farm work, enjoyed it, but in the city, I am fitter. I walk anywhere I can, as long as it's under an hour and as long as I have the time. Uh, I try to get off the busiest roads to get fresh air on the tree-lined streets, but walking is great. Here's how to encourage it. The plus 15 pedways that you see in some cities where you can go from uh, a higher floor in one building across a bridge, an enclosed bridge, to a higher floor in another building are a great way that people can get from one spot to another without putting on their overcoat in the middle of winter. They walk, uh, they enjoy uh, some mobility uh, regardless of the weather. Great idea. Secondly, signage. We're just getting to this. Berlin has done it. Vancouver's started it. Toronto has started it. How many minutes does it take to get from here to a landmark in the city? It's great information for tourists, and it reminds people who live in the city you can probably get there faster walking than you can in a cab or on public transit. Awnings and baffles, as mentioned before, they can extend the season a couple of weeks either end of the season and get people walking more, more often in a longer season. Big data. A lot of people are scared of big data. Big data t will tell you where I go, what magazines I subscribe to, who my friends are, who I'm with, uh, what I buy, etc. Pretty scary stuff. That all should be wiped. Nobody's business. But big data can also be really helpful for cities and their services and lifestyles. Planning for transport systems, for example. Housing, education, tourism 
can be done better with big data. Who's coming in? Why are they coming here? Why do they go somewhere else? We need serious policy for privacy and for shopping and for social media use. And 99% of big data need not be saved. We recently had a terrorist event in uh, Toronto where someone rented a van, drove it onto the street, injured and killed some people. Um, big data would tell us the size of that person's pupils, uh, the perspiration rate, respiration rate, etc. And big data just might be helpful to tell us who's doing what in our cities, if used well. There it is, the top 20 greatest ideas in urban amenities and services. Stay safe and enjoy the city. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.